What's a game? Pfft, that's easy. Games are stuff like this. And that. And... And... Huh. Hello and welcome to Press A to Learn, a show that doesn't need quick time events to get your brain juices flowing, because let's face it guys, quick time events aren't games, right? Right? Anyway, this is the first episode of a show where we're going to dissect games for all of its learning properties, whether it's to learn game development lessons for future game devs, or learn something new about games that you may not have considered before as gamers whatever the term gamers means, but as a future episode. Today, we're going to focus on what a game actually is. It sounds easy, really. We've all played games in some form or other. However, there are some products in the video game industry that have surfaced, which throws a curveball at conventional games. Stuff like Papers, Please and Stanley's Parable, leaving some gamers to deem it not a game at all. To answer what a game is, I want to take you back to the ageing old debate that has raged on within the game studies world for many years. It's essentially the nature-nurture debate of gaming, if you will. I'm talking about ludology versus narratology. Now, to cover many years of debating in this video would be too much, so I'm going to give these two sides a definition in a nutshell for you guys. And who knows, I may even cover these sides more deeply in a future episode. Anyway, ludology, ludo being Latin for play, and ology, to study or the study of, is, you've guessed it, the study of play in games. Crudely put, ludologists analyse games for their rules and mechanics sets, dictating that games must consist of three things, rules, game world, and gameplay. Narratology, on the other hand, comes from the word narrative, essentially meaning story, and ology, again, the study of. These people study games in the light that games are meant to convey a story, seeing games as a broader form of text. Now, these two sides have battled it out in academic wars thinking one side is far superior than the other, but to be honest, neither are wrong. That said, picking apart a game for its mechanics and rule sets only is learning one part of the overall experience. And equally, just looking purely at the story ignores the way that the game allows you to interact with the world. It's a combination of these two ideals that make a game, right? If so, where does this leave the game Dear Esther? A game where you essentially walk around and look at things. Is this a game? Well, some people dubs this and others of its sorts as virtual installations, the equivalent of a museum tour. They say the game must consist of a fail state, a way in which the player can fail the game typically conveyed in games as the character's death. Simply put, without this presence of fail state, a player bears no significance within the game's world, and essentially serves no purpose other than merely walking to the end. This said, to say something is not a game because it serves no apparent obstacles or ways to fail doesn't do things like Dear Esther justice. There is the game Loneliness, a game that has you control the character with the arrow keys, and the only interaction you have is, when you move up to a group of squares, they disperse. You would think with this stunning lack of story and mechanics, this is not enough to be considered a game. However, there are so many ways to play it. People play this game differently. Some rush up to the squares hoping that they'll stay. Some people timidly move up to them and hope they won't leave, and some people play the outcast and steer clear from them. I know extra credits mention this game a lot, and with good cause too. It's a fine example of simple mechanics delivering some of the hardest hitting moments of loneliness in a game. Do check it out, I'll put the link in the description below. Moving back to the point of fail states then, loneliness is a game that doesn't have a fail state, or any apparent obstacles to overcome. But this game does have interaction that really conveys loneliness. This game does it by making you, as the player, play it. And applying this to the Dear Esther example, 
Surely it's the way in which we traverse the game that would be different to anyone else who plays it. Someone could rush through and try to complete the game as quickly as they can, whilst others may take their time, absorbing the information and the world around them as they played. Because in this game, they are the main protagonist. Surely this in itself could define it as somewhat of a game. Taking control away from the player and making you look at things in a specific order would take away this game element, but it puts you in charge of the character. Okay, I feel like I'm rambling on, so I'm going to give you an example that you can be a part of. Are you listening? Okay. In the movie The Matrix, Neo gets given a choice, red pill or blue pill. However, you as the viewer get no choice in this, no matter how many times you watch the film. Each time you pop that DVD into the DVD player, Neo will always choose the same pill. That is a film a medium that is linear in terms of delivering content. It is always the same from start to finish. So, let's try something different here. I'm going to give you a choice between the red pill or the blue pill. And you will now have a choice. Interaction. See what I'm doing here? And to make things a little more interesting, I'm going to make it so there's a choice pattern that gives you a little bit of an easter egg video and a bad choice ending that sets you back to the start of the video. Now, get choosing. Tick tock, tick tock. Time's running out on the clock. Okay, if you played it, I hope you had a little fun. But why all of this? Well, what I presented you had rules. A set of mechanics, if you will, which is clicking of the annotations, pause, rewind, and fast forward. All presented via the YouTube interface. We had a little plot of trying to get the easter egg section before returning to this point and, for good measure, there was an almost fail state option that would take you to the start of the video. Which begs the question, was this a game? Okay, this is getting a bit too much. All we wanted to do was find out what a game is. We've brought in many arguments and points to be considered, and I'm sure by now many of you are forming your own ideas of what a game is. So. Here's my final thought. Questioning whether something's a game or not is essentially slating a product for not standing in line with the rest of the stuff out there. Let a game explore new forms of narrative telling. Let games question your freedom in games. Let games use film style narrative to help deliver information that otherwise would be too hard to attain via gameplay alone. Let games put you in control. They're all important for the games industry's growth and understanding and it's good to get a wide range of diversity and experimental games to try innovate new narrative or gameplay deliveries. But slating a game as not being a game, well, that will get us nowhere. As you can see by the amount of questioning we can chuck at just one topic, there's a lot we can learn about games, and also, there's a lot we can learn from games too. I hope this has piqued your curiosity of what's up ahead for this series, and I hope you stick around to learn more too. As a leaving question, I'd like to ask this. Did you think the red pill blue pill example in this video was a game? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. I'd love to hear your feedback about it. Also, if you learned something new, leave a like. And don't forget to subscribe for more Press A to Learn as well as other game related videos. I'm Matt, and thanks for watching.